Good morning, everyone. I'm Arielle Elliott. I run the Government Affairs Business Unit here at Bloomberg Government, and I would like to thank all of you for coming this morning. We're really excited to have you here. At Bloomberg, we're committed to diversity and inclusion, and it's reflected in our internal working groups, including the black professional community and the women's community who worked very hard to put on this event this morning. So thank you to all of them for doing that. We strive to establish an inclusive work environment where all Bloomberg employees feel respected for their diversity and empowered to impact the business and achieve personal success. We've convened today to talk about the importance of diversity. From government agencies to Capitol Hill to the private sector, organizations thrive when diverse ideas are at work. Today we have the opportunity to hear from Megan Smith, U.S. Chief Technology Officer, members of the Congressional Black Caucus Diversity Task Force, and their industry partners who are committed to a more inclusive and diverse technology industry. Thank you to all of the panelists for joining us, and we're looking forward to this conversation. Before we get started, just a few reminders. Um, there will be a Q&A after each panel discussion, and a member of our team will bring around a microphone. Please don't forget to introduce yourself before asking your question. If you are on Twitter, please use the hashtag BeGovTech. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean Edwards, Chief Technology Officer for Bloomberg. Thank you, Sean. Enjoy. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for joining us this morning. Good morning. Yeah. So, Chief Technology Officer of the United States is a re relatively recent role. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? Yeah, so uh, President Obama created the U.S. Chief Technology Officer job. We're embedded in the Office of Science Technology Policy with Dr. Holdren, who's the President's Science Advisor, and he actually just celebrated uh, being the longest standing science advisor since Vannevar Bush with FDR, so he published a hundred amazing things that President Obama has done in science and tech. Um, and one of those components is trying to bring more of our digital technical kind of, Mark Andreessen says, software eats the world, kind of Americans into government um, all throughout. So the CTO job is, it's interesting, it's uh, how do you help the president and his team harness the power of data, innovation, and technology on behalf of the American people? You're not running engineering, you're not running NASA or, or running, it's not the federal CIO, but it's really a, a, a kind of a lot like what you're doing, um, innovation instigation. And I actually think, you know, especially related to this topic, it's really about capacity building and unlocking the talent of our country, whether it's the modernization of government, which is one of the three major areas we work on, capacity building, things like the United States Digital Service, 18F, not only Americans coming into government who have built Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter, we have over 400 people already into government who have built those amazing products. Wouldn't it be cool if your government services worked as well as Amazon and, and, uh, and, and Dropbox and others, and we're going to try to get there, because we have those people in our country. Um, as well as things like the Social Security Administration is uh, teaching code boot camp uh, with uh, like 110 federal employees are going through right now. Uh, and SSA was using COBOL and, you know, old school tech and we've got them, you know, Grace Hopper has not been alive for a long time. Uh, <laughs> so we're trying to get that going. The second uh, bucket is really around policy work, a lot of tech, uh, bringing more technical people into the conversation around policy when we're doing tech policy, net neutrality, open source we just released um, from the federal CIO, or even technical people in the room doing any policy work, uh, just like you would have an economist or a lawyer or others. And so adding that um, around sort of capacity building. And then the third bucket is really where a lot of this conversation is, um, how do we capacity build the American people? How do we get more Americans into the kinds of jobs we are in uh, and really creatively confident and going for it on the things that they're passionate about and really included? And how do we use these new ways of solving problems, uh, sharing economy and internet and other right. things to solve our hardest problems, poverty, so, justice, et cetera. So on that last point, there's really, you can think of it in two ways, right? Building a new pipeline of people going into the workforce, but how about the existing uh, workers? You know, so what kind of policies, you th can you give us some examples of some policies that would help existing American workers uh, 
let's say, for instance, in the manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. increase their skills, uh, be more competitive, be able to get higher paying jobs? Yeah, so one of, one of the examples of some of the president we got us, uh, pushed us to launch is the TechHire initiative. Mm -hmm. So right now in the United States, there are 600,000 jobs, actually 5.5 .5 million jobs open. The largest chunk is in IT tech. Uh, these are not just that pure tech job like a Facebook or a, or a Twitter. Um, these are jobs in like the CIO shop across every industry. Uh, it could be manufacturing, agriculture, retail, medical, um, all these areas, and they're all over the country. And it really, our companies are really starving for these employees. There are not enough two-year and four-year degree people uh, to fill all those jobs. So they're going to hire as many people as they can from that track. So we'll talk about that track in a second. But this specific one is how can we use these new innovations of short course learning, apprenticeships, code boot camps, fast track, you know, coding is not rocket science, like uh, all of us should be able to speak this uh, language. The president really feels like it's a, it's a 21st century basic. So with children, we're working in youth, we're working in computer science for all. Uh, but on tech hire specifically, you can take very talented people from any sector into a code boot camp and really go from a relatively low paying job to a very high paying job. These jobs pay 50% more than an average American salary, they're hugely in demand. So one of the challenges in Tech Hire, Tech Hire really is an ecosystem place. So you're getting the code boot camp folks in a city. So let's take St. Louis. Uh, we had seen them doing that launch code and others were doing that. You're getting the workforce development folks to be aware of reaching out to everybody and pulling people in and seeing this sector and creating that pull. Um, and you're also working with employers. So our employers open to this. We have almost 1,000 employers now who have joined the Tech Hire Initiative. So we have 51 regions, including uh, the most recent 51st was South Central Appalachia. Um, but you know, Philly, Louisville, uh, Albuquerque. We were just with uh, leadership from Albuquerque. The, and, and one of the things that's been great is to watch the Department of Labor in their grant making as they're working to capacity build our community colleges and sort of new kinds of training. Mm -hmm. They just did $150 million in grants that Tech Hire cities were able to apply to. And Albuquerque was an example where Albuquerque in their four counties reaches half of New Mexico's population. So they are now using this new training method, not only with you know, whoever is there, but also really targeting youth, really targeting those coming out of prison, other you know, sort of real opportunities to upgrade a whole set of people into this kind of new economy, which our country essentially needs. Great, great. Let's talk about the pipeline. Sure. Um, you know, when we look at um, uh, computer science offerings in high school, um, there's only about one quarter of the K through 12 schools mm -hmm. offer a, a quality computer science or programming classes. So what are we doing about that? What are yeah. the kind of policies that would change about Not that? Not only is that happening, but also nine out of 10 parents want coding taught in exactly. school. Uh, and parents really struggle. They're trying to figure out how to get their kid in, and it's perplexing that we're not doing this. And so uh, President called for, after, during the State of the Union and, and in his weekly address after, uh, this idea of computer science for all. One of the things in our country, of course, our educational curriculums are distributed uh, throughout the states and local, um, and Department of Education does some of that. So we don't do a top-down call. But it's really about, we call these the all-hands-on-deck initiatives, where you're, you need a movement. And so what's really exciting is on Wednesday this week, um, Ruth Farmer uh, for the president was leading uh, really 40 pages of commitments were made in Computer Science for All uh, uh, back to school uh, push event that we had on Wednesday, which included um, everybody from you know, the, the teams, like an example of a city group. Chicago has already trained hundreds of teachers, thousands of kids coming through, um, and lots of cities like that, Rhode Island, Hawaii, uh, Arkansas, statewide, stepping up to get this done, um, New York City, others. So we're seeing real momentum, as well as uh, NSF funding has come through across the years and even more this year to make sure that we're funding those developing curriculums. So there's fabulous new courses yeah. that can be rolled out that are much more engaging at the high school and middle school level, as well as curriculum that goes all over. My favorite one was the Muskogee Creek Tribal uh, Community in Oklahoma teaching coding and robotics in Head Start. That's right. So, you know, why aren't we doing this with our two, three, four-year-olds? So that it's just the new normal that we can do these things. And what I loved about what they were doing also, it wasn't a contest-based thing. They were like, you know, and they, the woman was talking about, in their culture, they want to see deep collaboration. And so it's really a playful thing. It's called Bop Ball. 
And so the kids are playing together and helping each other and really doing this very modern thing. And so how do we get that to be true for all children? And how do we make this a new normal? And I, I feel like we are making progress, and we have to just really push hard on all of ourselves. The other one I talk about is uh, this idea of the maker movement. How many people in here know, you know, if I say maker, do you know Fab Lab? Yes, no. So we need all of us to know about this. It sort of reminds me, um, we were just talking about USDA, who has the egg extension. There's a federal building, you know, in, in every county. Could we have maker spaces just like Carver and Wallace uh, did in the day yeah. when we needed to upgrade our agriculture skills? Why don't we upgrade our maker skills? So we're working hard with them. Actually, the 4-H kids are all doing UAV uh, flying drone work on the, I think, the 5th of October across that group. I think there's 7 million kids or something in 4-H. So we're seeing pockets as well as groups stepping up to figure this out. In Baltimore, uh, Andrew Coy created a, a thing called Rec to Tech. So taking rec centers and creating spaces, you know, these are public spaces where kids can go, and they have nano for the little kids, mega for the big kids. It doesn't cost a lot of money, it's just, you just have to get together as a city and start doing it. Do you have enough qualified teachers and instructors and mentors for all of these programs? That's the key, is to have the, the kind of put together the all hands on deck work to do that. Certain regions are getting it done, and certain regions are learning from each other and starting to try to figure it out. Uh, it's a combination of the, like, so the corporation and national community service together with NSF have booked it together, amazing training, same as the code boot camps that yeah. anyone could take. You know, Flatiron was doing a program for teachers for $1,500. They would learn online and then come together for a week and learn how to teach code. So we could really use the accelerated programs. The other ones that I really love that you see are where it's cascading down. So maybe a college group of kids uh, and teachers are learning and then they go mentor the high school and then the high school's mentoring the seventh grade with an amazing young woman named Grace who was uh, part of the Data-Driven Justice and Police Data Initiative. She's a 10th grader. She's in New Orleans. She was teaching the police chief coding most recently. She actually mentors seventh graders and the seventh graders mentor little, littler kids and the teachers are coaching along that. So we really think through new ways to move faster on getting this done. All right, let's talk about diversity in the pipeline. Uh, I think it's only about one in seven in work engineers in the workforce are women. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's been a lot of attention towards this issue, the lack of diversity. Um, and what do you think is working? What's not working? What are we doing wrong? Yeah, so just in, there's a lot of good work happening, so we'll get into that in a second. But the, just really the root barriers are deep. And uh, it's everything from um, just there's been overt bias. Now we're in uh, that still exists, of course. But the hardest part is this kind of implicit bias, which lives both institutional and unconscious, sort of our brains working against ourselves. Um, you know, examples of unconscious bias, uh, you know, if, if in general in our society, if there's um, 10 characteristics for a job, uh, on average men will apply if they have three of them and women will apply if they have seven. So it's just a behavior we have. So that means we just, we don't have to make men like women and women like men. We just have to adapt our society and our culture to know that that's happening and be looking differently as who, who we're hiring. We also just, extraordinary bias goes in on hiring and advancement and small amounts of difference in performance reviews cascade across time. And there's amazing studies that people have done that really prove this. The, the exciting thing is not only is it the right thing to do, it's the prosperous thing to do that the best teams, though they might be slightly more uncomfortable because people haven't worked together in the same way, the best teams, the best results, the best financial performance, the best products come from the most diverse teams. So as a strategic opportunity for the United States, we are one of the most diverse societies on the planet and we have the opportunity, whether it's from the Native Americans who've always been here or the person getting off the plane right now who will probably come in and found a company and they may be a refugee, we have this incredible breadth of talent here. And it's really, to me, you know, when, when you talk to the president, this is one of the major 21st century moonshots, is to get all the talent to the table and use that as the strategic asset. It's been exciting to watch the national security teams, the STEM federal teams, how do we clean up and work on our own house to make sure that, that the federal leadership, the federal employees ourselves in the STEM work for NASA, NIH, others, national security teams are much more diverse uh, at all levels. So working on hiring, working on advancement, working on the C-suite, and working on the ecosystem around that. 
um, and really tried to advance best practice across. Now, there has been a lot of, uh, at least a lot of increased awareness of this uh, 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 lack of diversity for women in the, in the workplace. I, I remember last year there was headlines saying women are leaving tech in droves, which is more on the uh, retention side. But how about it's other? Culture. It's a culture issue. And uh, um, one of my favorite things that's happening is there's a film coming out called Hidden Figures. Have people heard of this film? I mean, most, how many people have ever heard of a woman named Katherine Johnson? A couple people, usually uh, even a couple months ago, that would have been like maybe one or zero. So Katherine Johnson is the American who calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission. Nobody knows that an African-American woman born two years before the vote did all that technical work. We've never seen her in the Apollo movies and all that. And, and actually, there's a really interesting graphic that I love the internet. People just do amazing things. So there's a data science group uh, out of the UK, I think, polygraph.cool slash film. Go there, and it shows you who gets to speak in film. And so not only are the stories completely missing, that actually technical women uh, of all races and all people of color have always been part of technical teams. Uh, for all of history, Ida B. Wells, one of the greatest data scientists and journalists this country's ever seen, you know, she and Frederick Douglass protested the Chicago World's Fair to try to have African American innovation shown, and they were not allowed. This has been going on a long time. So we need to stop, you know, mixing up the stories. My friend Joanna Hoffman uh, is an amazing physics grad from MIT, from Eastern Europe, sparring with Steve Jobs the whole time through the Mac team, astonishingly talented technical women. Um, for the first time, women are in the, Steve, in the films. She's the first woman to be in these films about Steve Jobs. And yet, if you look at the photograph from Rolling Stone magazine of the original Mac team, it's seven men and four women and a baby. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Susan Kerr. Uh, Susan Kerr is all the graphics you've ever seen. She, the Xerox Park team came and stared at the Macintosh, wondering, how did you do this in this memory footprint? She did the Chicago phone, all the graphics you've ever seen. The line in the film is, Susan made the bag. I think Susan maybe made the bag, too, but she influenced our society at a most fundamental graphical level. All of our phones live with the heritage of her work. Joanna came out of the film, and of course, Kate Winslet, Winslet won the Golden Globe for playing her. But the microaggressions in the writing that people are unaware of because of our unconscious bias, her son said to her, Mom, did you really iron Steve's job shirt? <laughs> and Joanna, of course, is like, no. I have never ironed a shirt in my life. It said once for you when we were late. <laughs> I mean, like, that is our bias. Of course the woman ironed the shirt. No, that didn't happen. And by doing that, we debilitate ourselves because we micro, it's like a microaggressioning ourselves, if I were to so make up a word. How about other underrepresented groups? According to the College Board, only 3% of the students that took the AP exam for computer science were black, and only 8% were Hispanic. Yeah, this so is what, a huge crisis. What, what are we doing? Country. What policies that we're doing that are specifically helping those groups and targeting them to increase STEM education? One of the biggest challenges is the access to teachers. And so the president uh, started an initiative called 100K and 10, which is uh, a central organization. The goal is 100,000 new STEM teachers in the next 10 years, and really making progress on that. Um, we need to just pull more people into, into this industry, either full-time or in a tour of duty, who have the kinds of backgrounds that you and I have. You did electrical engineering at IBM, I know, early on. So how do we get more people to serve in the teaching institution with these skills? How do we support our incredible teachers who are already there to have more active learning-based uh, experiences? Active learning is, would be like when you went to math and science class, it wouldn't feel boring or totally intimidating. It would feel like you're in the music or PE class or art. Like, this is fun and interesting. And yet we have this cultural idea that there are technical people and not technical people. That's just untrue. Katherine Johnson was in the White House. The president gave her the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And she was talking about how we just have to teach math in this totally fun way because it's the language of nature. It's inspiring. It's incredible. Um, well, I so, tell everybody I speak multiple languages, you know, English, C++, yeah. Python, JavaScript, you know. <laughs> so we want all our kids to have that. And, and, you know, one of the great things about pulling computer science into really anyone's lives is it, it creates a creative confidence. You know, uh, one of the things we know from research is the more kids or any of us actually do these things, it demystifies it. Right now it feels like Mount Everest, this scary thing, and especially in our culture we've taught people, you know, who would ever graduate from high school and say, 
uh, yeah, I'm reading and writing was my thing. Yeah. Right? But all day we say math and science was my thing. And, and so our culture is exacerbating the problem. And then very specifically, um, you know, back to that, that, that uh, data science on the web, even in children's TV, it's 15 to 1 boy programmers to girl programmers that our children watch, even though that's not even true to the stats. And so how do we help our Hollywood colleagues and our other media colleagues to show the truth of uh, who's actually doing this stuff and has always done it so that we just, Churchill said, the further back you can see, the further back you can look, the farther forward you will see. And so knowing the true history helps change the future. So telling these stories like Hidden Figures, which is the, the African-American women of the Apollo and uh, Mercury missions, um, and all Grace Hopper invented the idea of writing code. She wrote the first compiler, the first translator. She felt that more of us would be able to participate if we didn't only write in machine code. She was right. People fought her. Uh, Ada Lovelace, Lord Byron's poet math daughter with Charles Babbage, invented algorithms in the 1800s. We need to know that truth. If everyone knew that truth, then it would change how we think about things. And it, it's all of us together. And it's very important for a million different reasons, not only equity, financial, but also we have got a lot of stuff to solve. And so the more we have people bring what they love and are interested in together with all of the skills of the universe, including the technical side, the more we can move faster, like the President's Data Driven Justice Initiative, Police Data Initiative, Tech Hire, um, uh, agriculture, whatever, because you know, climate change, all the, these things that really require data as well as great storytelling. There's so much more to talk about on that subject. Let me touch on what you just mentioned. Um, uh, there is a, a wonderful book called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction uh, by a woman named Kathy O'Neill. Um, and um, she points out that, you know, contrary to most people's implicit belief that data science is going to uh, equal a level playing field, she points out that many of the algorithms that are actually encode, encode our existing prejudices. Yeah. So she gives examples of biases in credit scores, mm -hmm. which actually deny people jobs, mm -hmm. or uh, algorithms that bias towards um, uh, harsher sentencing, sentences for certain groups. Mm -hmm. What kind of policies and what kind of work can be done at the, at the government level to help uh, be aware of this or help eradicate this kind of problem. Yeah, critically important. So the president's been pushing us really hard on this area. First off, he brought uh, DJ Patel, who's the first U.S. chief data scientist to government, who's in our team, really incubating that. And DJ's focused on, uh, President Essen focused a lot on precision medicine, personalized health, cancer moonshot, as well as uh, we've added a lot of work in justice now with the events in the country um, around data uh, things. 25% of the jurisdictions of the country are now in the data-driven justice program, uh, specifically what that is, is uh, we have this thing where we scout and scale. So we look like venture capitalists, but venture catalysts. We look for places where people have already solved things regionally, which is typically true all over the world. If you look around, somebody's got either a solution or a solution in progress that's really interesting. Can we then get others to start doing that? So an example would be Miami-Dade. Miami-Dade uh, uh, was about four or five years ago was in trouble financially and was looking at how many people were in the prison system and so many of them facing substance abuse challenge uh, disorders, uh, mental health challenges. They realized that the police officers are stuck with taking people to, to jail or to the ER and no other option, even if they could recognize theirs. So what they did was they created a 12-bed stabilization unit in the hospital and then they trained police in 9-1 how to recognize this case and how to de-escalate and bring people to this alternative uh, path. And so of 50,000 uh, situations that presented themselves as this case, they only made 109 arrests. They went from 7,000 people in jail to 4,900 people in prison uh, and closed to prison. And so how do we get that kind of, and they were using data in different ways. Camden, New Jersey, uh, noticing that 205 people are cycling between homelessness, health, and the criminal justice system. How do you help that group of people have a different outcome by serving them better. They changed their data science work there and how they were tracking that using privacy in the right ways and dropped uh, the cost and the, built the services that really make a difference. So I think uh, first off, using this stuff for solving problems and then to your main point about uh, sort of bias and other things in the algorithms, the president uh, had us do the big data report really diving into the challenges around discrimination in finance and other places that we can get ourselves into if we're not watching. And this whole series of work this summer around artificial intelligence and machine learning 
um, conversations around jobs, around security, around safety, around control, around law and policy, and around uh, use. The more we get more of us into the design seat uh, and the confidence and creativity, the, just the better the products are going to be and the more we're going to catch these kinds of algorithms that are coming from the unconscious bias in our minds. Thank you for this riveting uh, discussion. I, I, I could go on for hours with this, um, but we have to go on to the next panel. Next, we'll continue our conversation about diversity and technology with members of the Congressional Black Caucus Diversity Task Force, uh, moderated by Bloomberg News Washington correspondent Toulouse Olorumpa. Thank you. Thanks.